once in a while, I come across a bug that I can't help but admire. I have trouble sleeping. I forget to eat. It's an adventure. Bugs like these consume me. It's exciting and stimulating. And when I figure out the devious ways in which they're causing the system to fail, I feel victorious. Princess one, dragon zero. This particular bug was the other kind of bug, the mind-numbingly boring kind, the kind that causes all the other items on my to-do list to seem suddenly important. Surely I can't fix this bug right now. I have a toilet to scrub. The bug was in an application whose sole purpose was to allow villagers, actual flesh and blood villagers, to post gossip on the web. So who got hitched, who had a baby, who has a birthday coming up. And the gossip would then get piped straight into the production system of the local village rag, where it would be printed on actual paper alongside the story of the largest fish to be caught off the dock since 1962. So the broken feature was the feature that when Alice posts a picture of her new baby allows Bob to tell everyone that they should come gossip about it. In other words, the broken feature was being able to gossip about the gossip. The strategy I chose to solve this problem was to get the feature fixed as quickly as I could, preferably without reading any code. The full bug report read as follows. I tried to share by email, but nothing happened. I opened up the application, put in my email address, clicked the button, and lo and behold, the villager was right. Nothing happened. I activated the JavaScript console and tried again and got a 500 error. The JavaScript was trying to make an asynchronous call to an endpoint inside the application, and the response that came back in the little debugging window was a wall of text formatted as HTML. So I copied out the call with all the parameters so I could call the endpoint using curl so that I could redirect the output into a file so that I could finally then open it in a browser. And the stack trace was exactly one line long. The execution hadn't even reached the controller action. Some before filter blew up trying to send a message to nil. So a quick investigation revealed that the before filter was completely irrelevant to encouraging gossip and the solution was to bypass it altogether. So now, I was expecting to get a 200 OK, a snippet of JSON, and an email in my inbox. And instead, I got another stack trace formatted as HTML. And this time, the code managed to get all the way to the email template, to the ERB template before it blew up, in something to do with translations. And the stack trace drew out the entire feature. It starts in the controller, in a method with the outrageous name share by email or SMS. This calls out to a module called sharing, which has a method called send to recipients, which presumably is a collective term for email addresses and phone numbers. The next stop in the stack trace is send to email in the same module. This further delegates onto an action mailer, which sends an email using a text template, and which is internationalized and interpolates strings from a locality file. And the error message actually displayed the exact line of code that was failing. The internationalization thing is some fancy string interpolation, takes four arguments. And the ERB template was sending in only three of them. So by matching up the keys in the error message, it was pretty straightforward to determine that the missing key was tidbit sender. So I patched the template, kicked off the email, and at this point, I did get back a proper response. And also, the email arrived in my inbox. So my work here is done. Management would be impressed. Heroic save and all that. And the truth is, I did what the French call le minimum syndical. This is a term that mocks the bare minimum. It makes fun of bureaucracy, bureaucracy for setting standards that are so low that you literally could not do worse because at that point you would not have done it at all. Now having fixed this feature, I was sorely tempted to tiptoe away. 
I knew that if more bugs came, uh, were discovered a few months down the line, I wouldn't be accused of negligence. My reputation would be pristine. My name is not even in the commit history for the feature aside from those two lines. So I'd be clear. Still, I was unable to turn my back on this code. And I'd love to pretend that the reason I couldn't leave this alone is that I'm a good person. I'm a morally superior being. And I'd be lying. I'm driven by fear. The code might be decent, or it could be a stinking quagmire of rot and decay, and without at least glancing at it, I can't know. I fear stinking quagmires of rot and decay. I dread getting sucked into them and being thigh high in mud and leeches and wrangling Boolean gates with one hand and fighting off stack traces with the other, and the last thing I want to do is wade into that swamp. But I fear that it's gonna cause me X hours of pain. Let's say three, three hours of pain. If this blows up in my face at 2.45 a.m. one night, then I am likely to spend the three hours and get it wrong, causing me three to four days of mopping up and hell and pain, writing scripts to parse access logs so that I can put lost orders back in the database, hypothetically. It's this fear that motivated me to take one tiny step to Eyeball the code, just look at it, and make an evaluation about how likely it is to blow up in my face at a particularly inconvenient point in time. So before we look at the code, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the tests. Right, moving on. <laughs> in the controller, in the share by email or SMS action, the first thing that caught my eye was a constant that I had never seen before, tiny URL. So it was not present in the stack trace. The email I received did not contain a shortened URL. And the logical explanation is that this is only used for the SMS portion of the feature. And it's true that we are building up the text message for the SMS here in the controller on every request whether or not we've received any phone numbers to send the SMS to. However, the text message also does not contain a shortened URL. In fact, once the URL, tiny URL, is generated and assigned to this local variable, that variable is never referenced again. So let me show you the tiny URL module. Actually, let's have the comments in the code tell us a little bit about it. We have a base exception class. We also have an exception class. Incidentally, the only thing that the base exception class is used for is to define this exception class, uh, which in turn gets used exactly once. This is a bit cryptic, but the method name does a pretty good job of explaining the comment. This is both cryptic and misspelled. <laughs> but again, the method name explains what's going on. So enough about comments, let's look at some code. This is the core piece of tiny URL. Now you don't have to read the code, just notice that we're calling out to an external service over HTTP. Every time we call the share by email or send an SMS action, we call out over HTTP and then throw away the result. Now the author of this code has thoughtfully added caching, so we might not make the call on every single request, and besides it only happens in staging and production. You'll notice that the case statement always returns, therefore the last nine line will never be reached. And also you can see that the case statement has exactly two outcomes, true or false, and we do have simpler means of achieving the same result. The caching mechanism manages to use both a module variable and a module instance variable in the same breath. It turns out that the tiny URL module is not used by any code anywhere ever. So it can safely be deleted. The code has been racking up expletive points uh, pretty quickly. Now expletive points or expletive points if you're American uh, are also known as XP. 
They're an equivalent measure to WTFs per minute. So we found two bugs where only one was expected. Bugs congregate. There's dead code. There's a gratuitous case statement. The code uses a module variable. The code uses a module instance variable. The comments either state the obvious or are incoherent. We're building a text message even when we're only sending emails. The entry point into the feature is a method called share by email or SMS. Apparently the method does two things that are so unrelated we cannot even use and in the method name. There are no tests. The code is calling out over HTTP on every request and never using the result. <laughs> We've accumulated 62 expletive points, but wait, there's more. And unless else is being used to determine the response for the action, and it's switching on a flag called invalid name, giving us a double negative for the happy path. The invalid name flag is actually pretty spectacular. A uh, name must not exceed 40 characters to be valid. And the significance of the number 40 is unknown. Out of curiosity, I kicked off the curl command with an invalid name. I got a reasonable error message and an email. So the process goes like this. Having determined that the name is invalid, we send out the emails and text messages, and then we, turn, we return a, an HTTP 400 bad request. You'll notice that nil is totally legit. Now it seems likely that if, hitting, if we hit the controller action without a name, it would result in an email being sent out, and instead we get a 400 bad request. And the error message tells us that they have already been told. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> now it turns out we don't get an email because the send to recipients method has a guard clause against nil names. So let's look at what else it has to offer. In the sharing module, the send to recipients method is very, very complicated looking, and it has a comment that explains what the method does. Unfortunately, every single part of that comment is wrong. There is no message key. The hash key is called SMS. There is no email recipients key. It's just email. And there's no SMS recipients key. It's called numbers. And you'd think that it can't be more wrong, but it is. Even if all the keys were named correctly in the comment, the comment is still wrong because the message that gets built up and sent via params doesn't actually get sent to emails. We have an ERB template that the action mailer uses to use that. So the lesson is comments that restate the method implementation are bound to decay and should be deleted. So the method has code to clean up the text message. That code never ever gets called because the params hash never ever has a message key in it. Then it cleans up the name. Now this is reasonable, aside from the fact that the controller validated the length of the name, less than 40 characters, uh, and that was before passing it to this method, and now having cleaned up the name, it could be now be shorter and therefore valid. And then it goes ahead and validates the length of the name, again, this time with a cutoff of 41. So once we've gotten back past all of the validation and the cleanup, we get to this block. <laughs> so let's break this down. We combine emails and phone numbers that came in separately into a single array. Then we iterate over the whole lot and use regexes to figure out whether we have a phone number or an email so that we can dispatch the notification using the correct protocol. <laughs> At the very core of this block, we have two methods, send to email and send to SMS. And we'll look at send to email first. So according to the comment, the send to email 
method sends email. The comment is only partially correct. <laughs> this is very confusing, so I'll go through it step by step. Alice posts a picture of her new baby. Bob goes to the website, enters Charlie's email address to tell him about it. So the tidbit was created by Alice, and if we don't have her email address, we will skip blithely past the part where we actually dispatch the email to Charlie, whose address we have, because Bob gave it to us. And here's the thing. In this application, it's very likely that we don't have Alice's email address because she signed up using her cell phone. If she forgets her password, we're going to send her an SMS, not an email. We prefer to report good news, always. <laughs> so remember this block of code? I actually simplified it. Uh, originally, it looked a lot more like this. So returning true here ultimately causes us to tell Bob that Charlie got the email, regardless of what actually happened. In the other branch of the con conditional, we send the send to SMS message, which, uh, according to the comment, sends SMS. <laughs> there are lies, damn lies, and comments. <laughs> so, what does this code say about the developer who wrote it? Well, it's easy to criticize, and a whole lot of fun. It's tempting to believe that whoever wrote the feature is stupid, or a bad developer, or at the very least, a bad person. <laughs> this is known as the fundamental attribution error. When somebody writes terrible code, we make assumptions about why that is. On one end of the scale, we attribute bad code to individual traits, to their personal fixed characteristics. They're not skilled enough, or they don't care enough. At the other end of the scale, it's situational, a momentary lapse due to contextual pressures. So on one end of the scale, they're a bad person. The other end of the scale, they're having a bad day. The forces that push us around from moment to moment are invisible. We notice them. We're in the thick of it. We are in our own lives, and we can't help but notice them. But from the outside, these pressures are hard to see. And the farther we are from the situation, the harder it is to imagine them. And the result is that people we don't know are bad developers, whereas we and our friends are just having a bad day. So what happened with share by email or SMS? How does a smart, experienced developer like the author of this code end up with a mess like that? Surely they didn't sit down one morning, write the feature from one end to the other, finishing with a flourish. Most likely what happened to them is what happens to all of us. Rush jobs, rapidly changing requirements, corners that get cut. And even without pressure, this was not an ideal situation. For one, this developer wasn't actually on the project. This gossip application, that was me and one other guy. So it was an unfamiliar code base to them. And second of all, the code base was terrible. I mean, it was not exemplary code. It's not an, a, a code base you'd like to inherit. Then again, who knows? Maybe there was no deadline. Maybe the programmer understood the code perfectly. Maybe they were just bored or drunk. <laughs> if you strip away all the fuzzy, muddled, messy humanity of it all, you get down to an interesting equation that is based purely on rational choices. So imagine a scenario where player one and player two may either cooperate or defect. So if both players choose to cooperate, they both get three points. This is a reward for mutual cooperation. And if both players choose to defect, they get one point each, a punishment for mutual defection. If player one cooperates and player two defects, then player two gets five points. This is known as the temptation to defect. And player one gets zero points, known as the sucker's payoff. And in terms of software, 
Cooperating means coding with care, whatever that means to you or your team. It could be taking the time to add, uh, add tests, making sure that your methods are short, that their names are expressive, that you've deleted all the trailing white space. And defecting is not doing those things. Defecting is committing with no thought to how much sense this will make to the next person who's gonna see it. So here's the thing, if player one knows that player two is going to defect, then it is in player one's best interest to defect as well. Both players get one point. On the other hand, if player one knows that player two is going to cooperate, then it is in their best interest to defect. They're gonna get five points, player two will get none. So the rational choice here is always to defect. And yet by doing so, everybody loses. So notice that this is not a zero-sum game. The players do not have strictly opposing interests. The largest number of points on the table for a six, single round is six, and the only way you can get that is if the players cooperate. Defection is only the rational choice in a single shot game, or a, a situation where the, the number of games is fixed, or the time period is fixed. There's no incentive co to cooperate if you're never gonna play against the same player again. The dynamics change completely if player one and player two interact on an ongoing basis. Now in most realistic situations, you don't know when the last in, in, um, interaction will take place. So if player one and player two play an indefinite number of successive rounds in a game, then when one player defects, the other player has the option of retaliating in response in the next round. And in this situation, there is no single strategy that will always do well. So if the other player chooses a strategy of always defecting, the best that you can do is to always defect as well. So now what if the other player chooses the strategy of permanent retaliation? They start off by cooperating and then you defect once and they never cooperate again. In this situation, the best that you can do is to always cooperate. So what's a rational person to do? It turns out that the most robust strategy across the largest number of situations is as follows. Cooperate at first until the other player defects, at which point you retaliate immediately. If they back down when you retaliate, forgive them completely, hold no grudges, and start cooperating quick, uh, as quickly as possible. So this is Game Theory 101, and it suggests that you should be nice. Now they have a very particular definition of nice, it doesn't involve being a pushover. In game theory, nice means don't be the first to defect. So if the other player never defects, it's all good. Everybody wins. There's a great book that covers a lot of the research that was done on this in the late 70s and early 80s called The Evolution of Cooperation. And it's about computer programs pitted against each other in a grand tournament. Also talks about a lot of the follow-up a research that was done after the tournament. So the research was initially about the fundamental problem of cooperation in society. It starts with the question, when should you cooperate and when should you defect in an ongoing relationship with another person? And the results of the tournament were so surprising that the researchers began to look at what makes it possible for cooperation to evolve in an environment of pure self-interest. So the book turns into a fascinating exploration of evolution, but from a strategic, not a, a genetic standpoint. The strategy that won both rounds of the tournament was called tit for tat. It was the shortest program submitted, and it worked like this. Cooperate on the first move, and then do whatever the other program did on the previous move. That was it. And the thing that made it so successful was that it avoided unnecessary conflict, it was highly provocable, and it forgave immediately. Also, it was incredibly easy to understand, so the other program was able to adapt accordingly. So, I am making software out to be some grand competition where developers compete against each other, which is ludicrous. And the problem is that we often behave as though it's the case. This abstract formulation 
maps shockingly well to the costs that we pay in order to deliver software. When everyone on the team cooperates, the team delivers good software with a reliable cadence. Everyone looks good. Everyone can be productive. If one person on the team defects, then that person looks efficient. They're taking off features on the backlog. They're fixing bug after bug after bug, many of which they introduced in a previous fix. They're productive. They deliver all sorts of heroic saves, and they do it over and over and over again, quickly and reliably. And the rest of the team slows down, both from trying to understand that the code, the code that this person is writing and from shoring it up, from having to rework it wherever and whenever changes are made. So they add tests, they improve ha error handling, they extract responsibilities, and the time it takes them to make a change increases. If the whole team defects, there's an initial rush where features are delivered rapidly, but we quickly hit a point where each change takes longer and longer to make until we reach a pathetic but stable equilibrium where progress inches forward in an endless, painful struggle. Humans are biased towards cooperation. We're, most of the time, we'll cooperate, even when it makes no rational sense. Yet, in being irrational, we will also gleefully de defect, even when we have no incentive to do so. And sometimes it's just easier to not, you know, not write those tests, not rename those variables. We want to do the right thing. But how often do we slip? How often are we in a rush for no particular reason other than habit? How often are we tired or flustered or distracted? How often do we commit and just move on with our day? Good intentions are meaningless. Every commit we make tips the balance ever so slightly in one direction or the other, an inch towards entropy, an inch towards increased order. Perfection is unattainable and ultimately irrelevant. If most of the commits you make are shifting the balance towards increased order, no matter how slight that shift is, you will have a code base that constantly improves. So I urge you to ask yourself before you commit, am I cooperating or am I defecting? Thank you. <laughs>